Well, seven years after Obamacare passed, Washington is once again at war over health care. The war isn't simply one between Democrats and Republicans, but instead between different factions of the Republican majority in the Congress. We'll talk to the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, in just a minute. But first, take a look at what's been happening here in Washington. This is what the American people have asked for. This is what those across this country have wanted. And we've been willing to listen, and now we will leave. Right now, the where it is, it is not, it's not what we right. told the voters we were going to do, and I don't think it's going to bring down the cost of insurance, which has got to be our goal. This is the conservative alternative to Obamacare. This is how we're going to reform health care in America and give choice back to people, rescue the failing uh, individual market. We're proud of this piece of legislation. What's been introduced in the House in the last 24 hours is not the Obamacare replacement plan, not the Obamacare repeal plan, we've been hoping for. This is instead a step in the wrong direction. Well, the Speaker of the House may have his work cut out for him. The American Health Care Act, his bid for replacing Obamacare, is getting blasted by some of the conservatives whose support he may need to pass it. The House Freedom Caucus says it is, quote, Obamacare light. The Heritage Foundation says the bill misses the mark. Several Republican senators say they are unimpressed. What exactly is going on? Speaker of the House Paul Ryan joins us now with an update on all of this. Mr. Speaker, thanks for joining us. Yeah, you bet, Tucker. Good to be with you. So it's been seven years to the month since Obamacare passed. And I guess the obvious question is why in all that time couldn't Republicans formulate a plan most of them agreed on before going public with it? It looks instead like chaos. Why is that? Well, actually, I don't think it really is chaos. I heard your lead in and heard what you said, but yeah. here's, here's what we did a year ago. A year ago, House Republicans said, we need to take a plan to repeal and replace Obamacare to the country. We spent a year working on this plan. All House Republicans participated in this. We had these working groups where anybody who had an idea brought it to the table. Right. And then we reached consensus as conservatives, as Republicans, on what that plan looked like. We called it a better way. We put it on the Internet. We all ran for Congress in 2016 on that plan. I remember. It was modeled on the Tom Price legislation. That's what this is. This is the legislative text of that plan that we ran in 2016 on, on what we would replace Obamacare with. Tom Price, who's now the secretary of HHS, was the architect of it. Twelve Freedom Caucus members were the co-sponsor of that bill as recently as December. So we are going through what I would call the sort of typical growing pains from being an opposition party fighting Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid to a governing party. And now we're translating that legislation, that, that plan, into a bill. Look, I'm really excited. Here's why I'm excited. Wait, wait, we're no, I'm taking, sorry, wait may I just ask yeah. you just really quick? Yeah, go ahead. So go ahead. you rolled it out yesterday. You said you've been working on this for a year with some, you know, with precise terms and everything. You, when you rolled out, you must have known that lots of members of the Freedom Caucus and the Heritage Foundation and a bunch of Republican senators were going to start barking about it. Why not wait until everyone's on board with the version before rolling it out? Well, like I said, uh, all these folks helped pass this. We campaigned on this last year. Right. We did, we did talk with all of these people. What I think is happening is people are getting a little confused about what you can and cannot put in what we call a reconciliation bill. Right. So I'm getting a little technical here. No, I understand. But there's three phases here, and that's what a lot of outside groups and folks just don't understand the fact that if we put everything in the bill we possibly want, we, we would have a filibuster. We wouldn't be able to pass it in the Senate. So this bill, which is the first phase of a three-phase plan, is what we can pass without a filibuster in a budget bill. There are things like interstate shopping and health care, association of health plans to let people buy, bulk buy their health insurance nationwide right. through buying pools, medical liability reform, all those things we very much believe in, which is part of our Better Way agenda, you cannot put in a budget bill because then they can filibuster that entire right, I bill. I understand, and tort reform and lots of other things. And right, I don't right, want to keep right. pressing you on this because you no, know, so you let know me as just well finish as the point. Let me these are members point. of Congress, so they know I that. They know what a reconciliation bill is. Yeah, well, well, we're finding that some don't. So, so what we're having here is we're passing this first installment, which is to gut Obamacare, repeal the mandates, repeal the taxes, repeal the spending. Then we replace it with conservative Republican tax policy that has been long-standing conservative reform. Health savings accounts, tax credits go by what you want to buy in state-regulated marketplaces, not federal, and risk pools. This right. is something that conservatives through the Heritage Foundation, through AEI, have been pushing for years. And then the other pieces that we really believe in, 
Tom Price in phase two deregulates the marketplace. There are 1,442 provisions in Obamacare that says the secretary has discretion. Tom Price is going to use that discretion to unwind Obamacare. And then phase three, pass those other bills we very much believe in, like shopping across state lines, like medical liability reform. Right. Those things will pass here in the House because it only takes a majority. We're going to send it to the Senate. We're going to put pressure on the Senate to pass it, but they can't filibuster that. Okay, so, so here's we... the problem right here. Tucker. Okay. It took me like seven sentences to explain all of that. And it's that confusion that I think is running this issue. But the point here is we are keeping our promises. We're excited about this. We're taking one entitlement, we're defederalizing it, and we're capping it. The other entitlement, we're repealing it and replacing it with Republican conservative tax policy. This is nothing but a win for conservatives. Well, okay, so let's get to the let's get to the tax policy. So as I understand it, I'm just reading this, so I may have it wrong, but there there's an investment tax in here, the net investment income tax. And as far as I know, it only kicks in on couples making over a quarter million dollars a year. So it's a tax on wealthy investors, and you're eliminating it. In a yeah, three point eight percent tax. Yeah, it's, that, it's that's yeah. exactly right. So I guess my question is looking at the last election, was the message of that election really we need to help investors? I mean, the Dow is over 20,000. Are they really the group that needs the help? This was a tax on capital income, which is bad for economic growth. It's basically a capital gains tax increase, effectively, to finance Obamacare. We're undoing Obamacare, so we're not going to keep Obamacare taxes in place. So all of these taxes, a trillion-dollar tax cut that this bill represents, that is part of that trillion-dollar tax increase that was in Obamacare to finance Obamacare. No, I know. But we're repealing. No, but we promised okay. we would repeal the Obamacare taxes. This is one of the Obamacare taxes, so we're keeping our promise. And by the way, it's bad tax policy because it's bad for economic growth, and we're also repealing the Obamacare spending. So we're getting rid of its taxing, and we're getting rid of its spending, and this is us keeping our word. You may want to keep that 3.8% tax. We're not going to keep it because it was part of Obamacare. Well, but lots of things are part of Obamacare that you just said a minute ago you're not doing anything about because you can't well, under reconciliation. Only because of reconciliation. You don't have to meet, that's, right. that's right, but you just said that you don't have to meet every promise in this first round. That's and right. yet, but, I guess it's a macro question. But fiscal question. policy we can be, but tax and spending policy okay, we can, so I'm that's aware. what we're doing. But also, I mean, you have... The overview here is that the, all the wealth, basically, in the last 10 years is stuck to the top end. That's one of the reasons we've had all this political turmoil, as you know. And so kind of a hard sell to say, yeah, we're going to repeal Obamacare, but we're going to send more money to the people who've already gotten the richest over the last 10 years. I mean, that's what this does, no? I'm not a leftist. It's just that's true. I, I'm not that concerned about it because we said we were going to repeal all the Obamacare taxes. This is one of the Obamacare taxes. The other point I'd say is okay. this dramatically helps us toward tax reform. I know it gets a little wonky. But by getting rid of the Obamacare taxes, the next bill up coming up this spring and summer is tax reform. And that means the new tax code that we're proposing, we put this in our Better Way plan too. It's a part of our blueprint. Go online and read that as well. That will not have to overcome those Obamacare taxes. Meaning, when we have a new replacement tax code to gut and replace this tax code, it won't have to also replace the Obamacare taxes. So right. by getting rid of all these taxes, we're lowering the revenue that is taken out of the American economy, out of families, out of businesses for the government, and we think that's really important. So tell me, the, the individual mandate was, was the thing that most people dislike the most, I think, about Obamacare. Right. And I just want to make sure I understand this. So that's gone, but there's going to be a cost for late enrollment, and it's going to be, if I'm reading this right, 30% right. surcharge on the annual premium. So if a plan costs, say, five grand a year, that means you have to pay this an extra 1500 a year to pay the penalty. Yeah, so let if me explain case, why that is. So why wouldn't I just wait till I get sick to buy insurance? No, no, and how that, is that, that going to work? That's the point. That, that's why we're tightening the enrollment period. We're having continuous coverage. And that's why Tom Price already put out a regulation saying we're not going to have an open enrollment period for a year. One of the reasons why Obamacare is collapsing and it's crashing and its prices are so high is because they had an open enrollment plan uh, time for a year, which is exactly what you're saying is what is happening now. What we're trying to do is prevent that from happening so we can drop the price of health insurance. You can't just say to somebody, wait until you get sick, then buy the health care. If right. you do that, then the health care gets really expensive. That's what's happening now. This tightens that up so that we can drop the cost of health care. But gives people a do-up, gives it, look, if you want to go from this plan to the next plan, by the way, in the employer market, they already have these rights. So what we're basically trying to do here, Tucker, is equalize the treatment and the fairness between people who get health care from jobs and people who don't. People right. who get health care from their work, they can move from plan to plan without any penalty. We want to just give people in the individual market, guys working 10, 15 dollar an hour jobs that don't get health care at it, we want them to be able to be successful. We want them to be able to have the same kind of tax treatment everybody else gets so that they can get affordable care. This does that. So what are you going to do about emergency Medicaid, which is a huge cost for the states, billions a year are spent, it's 100% goes to illegal aliens, as you know. 
Journal of the American Medical Association. 99% of this money goes to illegals, mostly to bear children at public expense in U.S. hospitals. And again, it's a big problem. Why isn't that defunded in this? Well, uh, again, we're looking at bird rule uh, reconciliation issues. What we're trying to do is make sure that you, you match couldn't defund it under reconciliation. Yeah, we've got a little issue with that, and we're working on that with the Senate. So, the, again, we've got these goofy Senate rules we've got to work with. We can't do every single thing we want to. We would do all of these things if we could without getting a filibuster. But we don't want to jeopardize this bill and make it subject to a filibuster, which means we can't do anything. So that's why we're trying to do this so that we conform to the Senate rules. But here's one more point I'd say: because we're delegating, we're giving Medicaid back to the states. It's right. a massive amount of federalism. Then the border state governors can do that. The border state governors decide what happens with their Medicaid populations. We cap it. We stop the expansion. We grow it at a slower rate over time, which saves trillions in the out years, which is a massive amount of debt reduction. And that is what we're doing here, which is a huge, huge conservative step forward for, for entitlement reform as well.